If you were able to walk into a room confident that you would be well received, seen, heard, and appreciated by others, and all it took was a few changes in how you navigate your everyday relationships, would you be willing to make those changes? It is possible to be both fully authentic and to experience the best relationships of your life. Now, here is the host of Navigating Complicated Relationships with behavior expert Mickey Gaffin Stone. And welcome to the Inspired Choices Network. This is your host, Mickey Gaffin Stone, and we are on the Navigating Complicated Relationships show. And one of the most complicated relationships you can have, apart from the one with yourself, of course, is the one you have with your kids. And I find that many parents want to be the best buddy for their child. And it's tempting, right? But Do you know, are you the best buddy or are you what you would think of as a responsible parent? What do each of those styles mean anyway? Parenting can be such a tricky thing to navigate. So let's begin with this question. How are you showing up? Do you know the difference between being your child's best friend and being the responsible parent? Do you know what the repercussions of parenting choices are for your child? It might sound like an easy question, but I assure you it isn't straightforward for everyone. In fact, I have clients who find this very challenging to answer. A high number of clients that just, they don't really know. And some of that is because of how they were parented, right? So let me just say right now, it might sound like there's some judgmental commentary heading your way. There isn't. I'm a parent too. And I know exactly how tough it can be. I also know how rewarding it can be. So no, there is no judgment here. This is about discovering the most effective style of parenting, the one that works for you. So in this episode, we're going to explore three key elements to parenting and what they look like for the buddy and for the responsible parent. At the end, I'm going to share with you how you can bring all of this information together and integrate it in a way that's hugely beneficial for you, your child, your child's future, your family as a whole. So do you know which approach is healthiest for your child? Well, let's see if we can figure this out. Do you find yourself giving in when you've asked your child to do something and they say, nope, not doing it. Or, you know, they they give you some lip coming back, right? What do you do with that? Do you just say, well, okay, just this once then. All right. You don't have to do it this once. That you might tell yourself you're still in charge, but you're not. If, If you're giving in and letting the child dictate when they will and won't do things or how they will and won't respond to what you're saying to them, they are in charge. And that's not a great place for any of you. And sometimes, you know, the, the child will pull out the uh, the ace card, right? I hate you. You don't let me do anything. You never let me have any fun, et cetera, et cetera. And there are different ways of dealing with that. Giving in would be tempting, but it's a short term, it's not even really a short term gain because you're going to have a miserable time for the rest of the day, really, because the child is now going to find the next thing that they want to push you on, right? If you imagine a kid in a bubble, they have to push on the outside of that bubble to see where, where does it give way, where is it solid? That's all about finding your boundaries, and we're going to go into that later. But dealing with I hate you in in particular, because kids will pull that one out and they'll tell you how awful you are and what a lousy parent. And if you're co-parenting, then or, or if you and the other parent, you're in the same house, but not on the same page, all of that can lead to, yeah, well, you're not my favorite parent. This other parent does it better right? They they really hit you in the feels. And there are different ways of dealing with that. I can give you my preferred way. The way I handled it, you can hear I'm from the UK originally. So I'm very much a fan of Monty Python. And I would use Monty Python 
mercilessly. So if my kids started whining, um, you're going to have to forgive me going into this little routine here, but I, if they would start complaining about things and moping and stomping around, then I'd get straight into the four Yorkshiremen sketch from uh, Monty Python. If you don't know it, look it up, Google it. It's hilarious, the four Yorkshiremen sketch. But this is basically where you say, you were lucky. I used to walk up the hill backwards 20 miles to school, get beaten to within an inch of my life, and then, you know, lick the road clean with my tongue. And that was half an hour before I went to bed. And you'd, you, and I'd just ad lib and I'd make it crazier and crazier. The end result was that sort of really annoyed child would either start laughing and they'd just go into it with me, or they'd stomp off go into the bedroom, slam the door, and I wouldn't have to listen to the whining. Either way, for me, that was a win. That was what I could handle. And it meant that our episodes were over pretty quickly. So what would your way of dealing with that be? Could, can you go into humor at a time like that? Because if you go into asserting your authority mode, that gives something to fight back against. It's really hard to fight against Monty Python. So, you know, I, I recommend that you think outside the box a little bit if this is something you're facing. And if, you, if you've got a difference in, you know, you allow one thing, the other parent allows more, for example, then you can simply in a calm moment, not at that time, simply sit the child down and explain, you know, Par different parents do things differently. This is the rules in this house. This is how we work it. This is how it goes in that house. You know, can you accept that it's different in different homes? Because this is how it's going to work. And if the child's old enough, if they're a teenager, you can maybe talk with them and ask them for their input on this. Um, not that they're making a decision, but they're telling you how they feel about it. They're telling you what comes up for them. And this is all in a calm moment away from those immediate discussions, right? <clears throat> so that's just a sample. I mean, what would it mean for you to know fully which parenting path you're on and know that you can change some things so that you have the fun and the functional back in your family? How would that knowledge benefit your child, do you think, as they grow into the adults that they came here to be? So going back to the subject of being the best buddy, it's, it's a fond image that many people have. You know, when parents talk to me about their, their child and, you know, as soon as they come home from work, they're immediately playing with the child, even though they don't want to. They want to break first. They want to rest and recuperate. But the child is demanding attention. That's problematic right away. It's problematic for your health. It's problematic because the child becomes used to getting their own way. How do you think a five-year-old who gets to dictate how much playtime they have is going to be when they're 15 or 20? Pretty obnoxious, probably, because they're able to say, you know, I want this, that's going to happen there. And boy, are they in for a surprise when someone says no. Um, so it, it's helpful to really set the boundaries early. You know, they can move and they should move as a child gets older. You're not going to be putting a 20-year-old to bed at seven o'clock. Or if you are, that's a different show and it's not this one. So let's, let's keep going with the parenting of are you the best buddy or are you a responsible parent? Now, there are pitfalls to being the parent who treats their child like a small adult. Um, now, I have personal experience of this because this is how I was raised. And it's a very onerous way of raising a child because when you have the child become an adult before they are one they don't have the maturity to handle all the things that you're telling them all the things that they see and all the responsibility that they're given of decision making how can you expect a, a young child to make big decisions when they're only just figuring out which color t-shirt works you know, there's there's a gradient to how we give kids responsibility. And when you talk to a child like they're a young adult, you're taking that away. And 
the child might look like they can keep up with you, but I can tell you that it's a very difficult path because that child is always going to think that they are not quite good enough. They're not able to be the adult the way you are. They're not parenting as good as you are. And sometimes, you know, when that child becomes a teenager, they can end up parenting the parent. And that's really unfortunate because then you get into a whole lot of limitations later in life that, you know, come up to bite them because they feel like they should have been a better parent. So teens are adults in training, absolutely. But the key is they are adults in training, which means you are giving them the, the information and the guidance as they are able to handle it. And not just assuming that, you know, you're this age, therefore you can do that. Depends on what they've learned, right? What, what have they been taught? And if they're in, moving from house to house, which some kids are, you know, if the parents are separate, then you don't honestly know what's going on exactly in the other house. You can only control what happens in yours. And that is a really important thing to take carefully, check, check your child's understanding for things, check what they know and, and what they're comfortable doing. And depending on the child, sometimes it's good to even take it back a little bit and, and just sort of really solidify their sort of comfort zone in these decisions you're asking them to make, because this is the perfect opportunity for you to teach them decision-making, but they don't learn by being given a big load of decision. They learn by building the skill. It's like any muscle that you work out in the gym. The more you practice with it, the stronger it gets. But if you take too heavy a load, you're going to tear that muscle. And that's a, a pretty good analogy for how it goes with loading up on kids, treating them as adults, wanting them to be your friend when they're just a little kid. You know, they're, they're just there to be a child and to learn about the environment. So if your parenting style is flexible to the point of the child often gets to call the shots, you know, the child will get to say where you're going, what you're doing, where you're going to eat out, that kind of thing. Occasionally that can be fun. The child will appreciate it. But if that's the rule of thumb, then you are not in charge. You're the buddy. You're a friend. And that's a, a sort of disadvantaged place to parent from because you, you don't have any authority when you're the best buddy. You, you have the friendship. And that also means when that child grows up and becomes a teenager and starts with the whole foot stomp, I hate you, that's going to hurt so much more because, but we're buddies. You know, you can't say that to me. We're, we're best buddies. What have you got then? at that point, if you've been sort of with this child as your best friend and now they hate you, you know, it's when you try and parent, they, they don't like it. So a big part of this can be all about how you were raised. And we're going to go into that after the break, which is coming up in just a moment. I want you to make sure you've got pens and pencils, papers, notebooks, whatever you need if you haven't already, because there's going to be some things coming up that you're not maybe aware of yet. And I would love for you to ask me questions later. If, if that's important to you, jump into chat and I will see you after the break. Do not go away. You are here on Inspired Choices Network. What if your relationships could be a source of delight instead of a source of struggle? In a world where human interactions are anything but straightforward, Tuning in to Navigating Complicated Relationships with behavior expert Mickey Gaffin Stone will offer you insights, tools, and a whole new level of understanding for you to use right now. Listen for Navigating Complicated Relationships with Mickey Gaffin Stone Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Central, 10 a.m. Mountain, 9 a.m. Pacific on InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. Are you a subject matter expert? Are you here to share your expertise with an audience waiting to hear from you in only the way you can deliver? Are you ready to have your voice amplified across the airwaves? 
Inspire Choices Network has a global radio platform streaming to millions of people across the world. Professionally produced and supported by an accomplished team every step of the way, you can broadcast from anywhere in the world knowing your voice matters and we ensure it is delivered with ease and efficiency. Eager to hear your message, the world awaits. Contact us today to become an Inspire Choices Network radio host. Email become a host at inspirechoicesnetwork.com. This is Navigating Complicated Relationships with Mickey Gaffin Stone. To participate in the program, join the live studio audience in our chat room at inspiredchoicesnetwork.com. You can also send an email to Mickey at gaffinstone.com. Now back to the program. Welcome back, everyone. I'm so glad you're still here. Before the break, we were talking about how it can be difficult to handle a child when you're raising them as your best buddy because you don't really have any authority. And my number one piece of advice when you are handling a, a child that's having some temper issues, you know, they're getting kind of stroppy with you, is humor if you can manage it. Monty Python, if you haven't discovered it yet, check it out. It's a little weird, but that helps with parenting. And someone in chat mentioned that some great advice that she was given was to not say something you can't follow through on and never make a promise or a threat that you, you're not going to keep to. And that is absolutely the fundamental rule. Yes, definitely. Because you will spend the entire day backtracking if you say something to your child that you then do not follow through on, either because you said something in the heat of the moment and it honestly didn't make sense. Like how many times have we heard or possibly said to the, the toddler, you know, come right now or I'm going to leave you here in the store. No, you're not. At least I don't think so if you're listening to this show. That's probably not in your parenting repertoire. So when you don't follow through, the child learns that, okay, my parent doesn't mean what they say, so I don't have to pay attention to it. And the only person that has taught the child that is you. So having something that you can follow through on and will follow through on, which is tough for a buddy parent, that, that is key. Yes, absolutely. So thinking about it before the time arrives is important so that you can be very sure that what you're saying is something you're prepared to follow through on. I'm going to get into that more in a little while because that's boundaries, which comes up every single time. It's the, the single most significant thing you can do as a parent is set and maintain boundaries. But right now, let's have a look at how were you raised? Like if you're listening to this and you don't have kids, first of all, kudos for being here. Thank you. And secondly, whether you have kids or not, how were you raised? Were you raised in the, the sort of popular Gen X version of Black Key Kid that was, you know, here's a key, get yourself some breakfast head out to school, do your work, come back, don't burn the house down and I'll see you tonight sometime. You know, if, if that's the case, then you weren't given boundaries. You also weren't really seen or heard. You weren't given any how-tos on how to do the things in life that you were expected to do. You were just kind of thrown out there. And that's one way of having the child be more of an adult than they're prepared to be. You expect more from them than they're able to give you. And if you have more than one child, or if you're thinking of yourself and when you have siblings, how often did you hear, well, you're old enough to know better. You shouldn't have done that because you know better. It, it's a, an interesting thing that parents will say. And if you look at it, if you examine it, it doesn't really hold up. I mean, if you knew better, you probably wouldn't have done it. But the other thing is, you're a child, so you have to experiment. It, it doesn't really flow. But this is what many of us were raised with. And a question for you to consider is, as you were being raised, did you feel safe? Were you in a safe environment where you could express emotions? Because most people don't grow up that way. You know, they, they grow up in a Parents might be lovely, but they can't handle their child being angry. Some people view that as a challenge to their authority. Some people just don't know how to handle 
anger because they were never taught themselves. So the child either gets booted out of the house or sent to their room or, you know, sent away somewhere. They're not safe to express anger. And so if that's the case for that child, they'll start to internalize anger. And that comes out in people pleasing, self-sabotage, a whole number of ways as they get older. And if this is you, you know what I'm talking about, right? You can feel that. If you were the kind of, you know, if you fell over as a child, for example, or somebody upset you and you're crying, your parent probably wasn't comfortable with that either. Who likes to see their kid cry? You know, that's not something parents tend to want. So we'll go to the go-to that we had as children ourselves. You're upset? Have a cookie. Oh, that person made you sad? Here, have an ice cream. You know, it, it always seems to involve fat and sugar, right? So, and, and then there's the, the style of parenting that will say, oh, you're crying? Keep going and I'll give you something to cry about. The same kind of parent would say, oh, you're bored? Here, I've got things for you to do. And they'll give you a list of, you know, household chores to do. This is still not having you feel seen and heard, right? You're, you're just, you can't express because if you do, something negative is going to happen to you. And that's, you know, that, that sort of stays with you for the rest of your life. And if you're being ignored, then th this is something that, you know, you, you learn to feel less about yourself it's a thing that you carry forward. And when you're looking at your parenting style yourself, many people will not want to repeat that. They will want to do something very, very different. So you're looking over your shoulder, at what was the parenting I had? What did I not like? And you're focusing on all the things you didn't like and you don't want to do them. And then before you know it, your mum comes straight out of your mouth and it's like, what? I, I did not just say that. Chances are you did because you're focusing on all the things you don't want. And as I've discussed in previous episodes, the reticular activating system, this amazing part of the brain that gives you what you're going to focus on, will put your focus onto wherever your attention is. So if you're focused on what you don't want as a parent, you are going to get that. And if you're looking over your shoulder at the parent that you don't want to be, and you're moving forward as a parent, you know, the, the image I like to use there is, you know, you're walking forward, looking backwards, you're going to end up on a tree. It's, it's not going to be very comfortable. It's not going to be very helpful. So what can you do instead? If this is you, if you're recognizing this, I invite you to not focus on what your parent did that you didn't like. I'm sure there's plenty, and I'm sure they did some stuff that was good too. But all of that's there. It's it's in you. You don't have to focus on it. Turn and look, what would your vision be for who you want to be as a parent? How would you love to show up for your child? And one way you can look at this is, who's your role model? Who embodies the things that you would love to have in front of your child for them to learn from? Because kids learn from modeling. They learn from what you do and they learn from how you show up. So are you showing up as in some way a mini me of the parent that you're trying not to be? Or are you taking on a new vision that's all yours? What you want for your child? Do you want that child to be independent? Well, cool. A lot of people say that. And in that case, what skills do they need? Let's break it down a little bit. This is something I do when I'm working with my clients is I can help them to work with that particular child on where are the areas of independence that are lacking at this age and stage? Where are they working wonderfully? Let's capitalize on those strengths. And then how can we start building the things that aren't there? So that by the time you get to adulthood, you've gone through your Te your teenage years, which is adult in training, you emerge as an adult and you do have those independent skills. How could we get your child to that place? And even if your child's already a teenager, that's not too late at all. There's plenty of time to work on the relationship, the skills that they need, and also crucial for teenagers, 
communication because this is the stage and the age where you get the communication open and non-judgmental leave the opinions at the door unless they're asked for and you know you you back and forth with the, your child because by now you're teaching them how to make decisions and you have to let them make the decisions even if it's not the one you want so long as there's no harm risked I mean physical bodily harm then let them do it let them try it and let them build that skill because this is how you keep communication open once they leave home this is how your child is still going to talk to you, not because you're nagging them or guilting them into it, but because they actually want to talk to you. They think you're, you know, you're now you're the buddy. Now you're a cool person, right? They still have that respect for you as a parent, but they can open up to you because they have a trust. They know you're not going to tell them, well, that's wrong. That's not good. You need to do it this way. Or what are you thinking? You have to do it that way. And Culture can come into this too at this point. Like you can hear that I'm a Brit, right? And in the UK, there is a predominance of, should we say, parenting that's not not the most positive language, right? Um, I, I grew up hearing, oh, you're all idiots and oh, you're stupid you are. And that's a stupid thing to do. And the word stupid and idiot was bandied about like punctuation, you know? We heard it all the time and if you made a mistake you were stupid you know this this is this becomes deeply ingrained and it's very tough to move out from and it tends to hold that person small so how is your child being raised what kind of language is being used is it the keep crying and I'll give you something to cry for or I, I doubt it. Most people these days aren't doing that, I like to think, but that may be optimism on my part. Um, and it can be hard if the child's really pushing your buttons. You know, I understand that too. Like I said in the beginning, this is not a judgmental space. This is just highlighting some of the things that can happen and the repercussions that can come from that. I mean, if somebody told you when you were a child that you weren't good enough, Tell me, are you still carrying that? Because I'll bet there's a story in there somewhere that you took on board as a child and turned into a limitation. And the way that you're not good enough shows up, or you're an idiot, as you would get in the UK, um, that shows up as a sort of self-sabotage, right? You get so far towards your goal and then boom, something happens that stops you from reaching it. And it's usually you that happens. And this is all part of the narrative that you got from someone telling you you weren't good enough. Now you have to prove that narrative. So parenting is, is important forever. It's not just as they're growing up and, you know, you're getting them out of the house or into the basement, however it's working in your household. It's more how can you help that child become the adult that they're going to be? And being a buddy is a very tough path to take because you just can't set boundaries from there, can you? In fact, if you're being a buddy, I'm going to hazard a guess that you don't know how to set boundaries. So we're going to look at that after the break, because honestly, I don't think you can look at it too often, too much, or in too many ways. So don't go anywhere. Stay right here on the Inspired Choices Network. I'm your host, Mickey Gaffin-Stone, and this is Navigating Complicated Relationships. I'll see you in a minute. What if your relationships could be a source of delight instead of a source of struggle? In a world where human interactions are anything but straightforward, tuning in to Navigating Complicated Relationships with behavior expert Mickey Gaffin-Stone will offer you insights, tools, and a whole new level of understanding for you to use right now. Listen for Navigating Complicated Relationships with Mickey Gaffin Stone, Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Central, 10 a.m. Mountain, 9 a.m. Pacific on InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. How wonderful would it be to carry your favorite Inspired Choices Network host with you throughout your day? Well, now you can. Inspired Choices Network now has its very own mobile app 
Our free app offers live streaming shows along with thousands of podcasts and TV episodes. Our shows cover a wide variety of topics. Whether you're waking up with us, carrying us through the day, and taking us to bed with you, we're always here for you to enjoy. We're easy to find. Just search for Inspired Choices Network in the Apple App Store or Google Play Store. This is Navigating Complicated Relationships with Nikki Gaffin-Stone. To participate in the program, join the live studio audience in our chat room at InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. You can also send an email to Mickey at GaffinStone.com. Now back to the program. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for still being here. I'm your host, Mickey Gaffinstone, and we are talking about being a best buddy or a parent that has a sense of responsibility to their child today. And I have some examples now for how the best buddy is showing up. Some of the things that have come up recently with clients of mine have been my teenager who is, you know, 15, 16, wants a tattoo. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm going to take my child to get a tattoo. Do you know where I can get that done? Well, I have a question for that parent. Obviously, you make your own decisions. But if you're looking at something as permanent as that, why? Are you looking at this because you're both going to go and get twinsy matching tattoos. Well, that's lovely, but how old are you making that decision? And then your child's 15 or 16. That is a, a thing that's permanently on their body. And you're doing this as a buddy, but I don't know, is it really necessary? They're legal at 18 to get a tattoo. So if your child really, really wants something permanent on their body, they can hang on a couple of years. It doesn't hurt them to do that. And, you know, frankly, what you want at 15 is not what you want at 20 or 25. So are they going to have to go over that with different ink? Are they going to have to have lasers? Like, what are we looking at here? Um, I just tend to think that the sort of that example of tattoos is something that the buddy parent is going to say yes to. The other type of parent is going to say, you know what, you need to wait. And an example here is my own, my eldest son came to me when he was about 16, I think, and said, mom, I want a tattoo. Well, you can't see on the screen, but I have tattoos and I like them. I was also a lot older than 16 when I got them. So my approach to him at that time was to point out how permanent it is, you know, how whatever, wherever you go, whatever you do, you've always got this thing on your body. And what was it he was thinking of having that was, you know, so important to have right now. And by the time I'd been incredibly reasonable about it and asking him all these questions, he was sort of irritated and stomped off saying, oh, I don't want one anyway. And I honestly think he was just doing it to see how far he could push me because he knew I had tattoos. So you know, that was an example of do I cave to the pressure or do I stand in parenting shoes and say, no, you're too young. And by the way, he still doesn't have a tattoo. Or if he does, he didn't tell his mom. And it's certainly not visible. Then there are some kids who start drinking underage and the parents will give them a drink. Again, different countries, different rules, but none of them tend to approve of kids drinking. So if you are doing this, again, think about the consequences of that. Are you encouraging the child to drink heavily? Maybe not right this minute, but where are they going to be in a few years time? If your child has, you know, we're talking early teens now, maybe mid teens, child has a girlfriend or a boyfriend. I want them to sleep over. Oh, that's a fun one. What do you do with that? You know, it's, how are you going to approach that? And if it hasn't come up yet, I invite you to start thinking about these things, things such as drinking, sleeping, tattoo, you know, sleeping over, tattoos underage, that kind of thing. Where are your boundaries? Because boundaries are going to need to be set. Now, if you're okay with them getting these things underway, then that's for you to deal with. But your child is not old enough. They're not mature enough. So there, there will be a cost to them. And that's a choice that you all get to make, right? But 
boundary setting for a lot of people is it seems harsh right like I, I don't want to be that parent that says no all the time and I don't want to be that parent that's miserable neither do I but with boundaries you're drawing a line and you're explaining why it's there what it is what it looks like and what happens when they cross those boundaries and then the key as I mentioned earlier is not to set a boundary not to say something that you're not going to keep to because that is where you live or die on that hill, right? If you move the boundary, if you change your mind, even one time, that shows the teenager or the child, whatever stage they're at, it shows them, actually, if, if you think of significant other too, it shows them that you don't really mean what you say, that you can't be relied on to follow through, and that there's actually no real boundary there so they can just kind of do what they want to do. So if this thing is important enough to you to set a boundary, make sure you hold the boundary. And I would recommend starting out on the things that are most prescient, most visible in your face right now. Start on those first and then kind of slowly pan out. Let's not go hog wild on setting boundaries every two minutes because the recipient is going to wonder what happened right it's going to get very confusing but that when know that when you do set boundaries that child is going to challenge them they have to because they need to know that they're real they need to know that they're there and if they keep moving they will push harder and you will be more challenged by them so moving boundaries is a moving target and I heartily recommend that you don't do that. It's it's going to be so tough for you to come back from. And that new line, wherever they moved it to with their behavior, is going to come back next time and next time. They're going to expect to be able to go to that point and be successful. An example I can use that I think we all are familiar with is the kid tantruming in the store. If you haven't seen one, then you don't go shopping <laughs> because they happen everywhere, right? And we all have a response to a kid tantruming. Oh, that parent should get control. Well, sometimes that's, uh, that's a little too late. But be that as it may, the tantrum in the store is a perfect example of a child push pushing the boundaries. I want that toy. I want that toy. And they will misbehave. They will get louder. They'll pull things off the shelves. Whatever it is that you really don't want them to do, they will do that thing until you give in and say, right, just this once, but you know, you're know, you not getting any dessert or how, however you respond in the moment. Because we often say things in the heat of the moment that we might not say later. And what that child has just learned by you giving in is, oh, great. This is the behavior that gets me what I want. So next time I'm going to go straight to this level of tantrum and I will get what I want. You taught them that by giving in. It's not the child being any of the things that we might label them as. It's what you've just taught them by moving the boundary. So this is why it's so important to maintain them, to keep them there. And I, I want to tell you a form of reinforcement. Reinforcement is the thing you do immediately after a behavior that strengthens it, that keeps it going. And this particular type of reinforcement is one that casinos know really well. It has a wonderful name. I love this name. Don't worry about repeating it, but it's indiscriminable contingencies. So much fun to say. And what it means is you anticipate getting the thing you want, the reward, but you don't know when, you don't know how big it's gonna be, but you know it's coming. So think of someone sitting at a slot machine. These days, you don't even get to pull a lever. You just push a button. I mean, man, that is boring. But you, you sit there at the slot machine and you push the button and it does its thing and there's the noise and the lights and you may or may not get a ticket out with some money on it. Okay, so you go again and you go again and you know it's coming soon because you've been waiting a while now so you keep going and then you do get something back oh cool i, I won 100 bucks okay so that's that's encouraging you keep going and then the next one might come just a few minutes later but it's small or it might come a few minutes later and it's even bigger whoa 
you are now hooked, sitting in that chair for probably the next eight hours because you know it's coming, but you don't know what it's going to be. And even though the casinos have signs everywhere saying the house always wins, I mean, they tell you, but that reinforcement is so strong that you'll keep coming back for more. And that's what happens with kids when boundaries move. That is exactly what happens with kids when you say one thing and you do another. So this is why I'm pushing boundaries as being such an important thing to set and crucial to hold. If you keep moving that thing, think of the slot machine, right? This, this is your kid on the slot machine. They are going to sit there and they, they have all day for this, right? Their job is to push that boundary and to get the thing they want simply because they need to know where they stand. That is their job as a child. Your job is to show them where they stand by maintaining that boundary. And the, the image of the slot machine, I think, can be very helpful in reminding you of just how huge the consequences can be if you have absent or really wobbly boundaries. So having a discussion, depending again on the age of the child, if you're talking about a teenager, you can explain to them why the boundary. There's even a thing called a behavioral contract that you can make up with that teen who you say what you want from them. They say what they wanna have as a reinforcer or a reward, however you wanna put that. So it's a bit like, I'm gonna go to work for you. You're gonna pay me this and these are my hours. And this is the work you want me to do, right? It's all set out in a contract. Well, you can do this with your teenager so that a particular behavior, if you've got a kid that's not doing homework, for example, okay. You can figure that one out. What are you prepared to bring to that table to help your child be successful? And what do you need them to do? So another example, now I've got to say with my parenting, um, a lot of it has been very outside the box. It's not been the options that people usually go for. And I've come in for some criticism for that. But I have to tell you, my two kids have done really well. So, you know, okay, I'll take it. Um, but one of the things I did with my kids when they were at a stage of homework difficulty was said, okay, you take care of your room and you do your homework. That is your job. I will do the rest. And I would literally not give them any other chores to do at all. And I was perfectly happy with that so long as they did their homework. That was the agreement and it worked very well. Now, I can't say they smiled all the way through the homework, but it would get done and we didn't have these big fights. So that was what I was prepared to bring to the table. You know, I'll do all the dishes and all the this, that and the other. You get your homework done and you take care of your own mess in your bedroom. I figured that was a fair exchange. What's yours? You know, if, if you're working with a teenager, what can you bring to them and say, you know, you do this and I'll do this? Where could you reach an agreement? And what is the result going to be for the teen that they particularly want. Think of you going to work. Are you going to go to work if you're not getting paid? Probably not. You know, we, we need to be paid. Your child needs to have something that's negotiable in, in this contract that they want. It's also teaching them a skill, right? You're teaching them how to negotiate for what they want. And you're teaching them how to handle it when they don't get everything they want. So this is, there's so many things you can do with setting boundaries that teaches kids skills. When we come back after the break, we're gonna look at it some more. And I'm also going to look at kids with special needs because parents that have children with special needs can have extra special difficulties in setting boundaries because the behaviors can be huge. So stay tuned, don't go anywhere. And I hope you're making notes. Let me know what your ex, your, um, enlightenment is from this if anything what if your relationships could be a source and i'll see you soon <laughs> what if your relationships could be a source of delight instead of a source of struggle in a world where human interactions are anything but straightforward tuning in to navigating complicated relationships with behavior expert mickey gaffin stone will offer you insights tools and a whole new level of understanding for you to use right now Listen for Navigating Complicated Relationships with Mickey Gaffin Stone, Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Central, 10 a.m. Mountain, 
9 a.m. Pacific on InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. This is Navigating Complicated Relationships with Mickey Gaffin Stone. To participate in the program, join the live studio audience in our chat room at InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. You can also send an email to Mickey at GaffinStone.com. Now back to the program. Welcome back, everyone. That was a funny little break at the beginning there. Um, so next week's episode is going to be more focused on children with special needs and applied behavior analysis, which is what I'm trained in, and how we can use that to help kids with special needs to function in this very broad and changeable society. But today I'm bringing in special needs now as well because parents with kids with special needs often have difficulties setting boundaries. Some of that can be from, in fact, a lot of that can be from external pressure. People don't understand what they're looking at. And frankly, unless you live with this, you don't understand what you're looking at. There's, there's a lot that can be going on. And I have a wonderful example that I just came my way yesterday. There's a video on TikTok. There are six videos, one after the other. I only saw one, I confess, but I was told that all six continued with this teenager having a tantrum. She had lost the plot. She's just almost lost her voice. She's, she's screaming and wailing so much. And what had happened was she'd had her phone taken away. That's all we know. So I don't have any more information than that. And the thing that we don't know, like immediately you see this older kid having a tantrum, all sorts of judgments can come up about her behavior. She's a spoiled brat, you know, all the things. I saw one person comment that, you know, if I'd done that as a teenager, I'd still be in a coma, you know? So, okay, the child might be 17, but we don't know anything about her and we don't know what happened when her phone was taken away. What were the circumstances? Was it just like grabbed and, and she was told off or what? But something that I did find out about that I think could fit here, and we don't know because we don't have the full circumstances, but there is a thing, it's not a diagnosis, but it's a real thing called rejection sensitive dysphoria. RSD. And this happens to people who have neurodiversity. Often it's ADHD where this shows up and it doesn't happen in every single person, but it's a sign or a symptom of complex PTSD. And it, it can show up as a full on trauma response where something seemingly as small as taking a phone away can be seen as a rejection that triggers all of this stuff that's in the body that's been building up over the years. And what it looks like to the onlooker is a full body meltdown, panic attack, palpitations. She, the, the person can have difficulty breathing. And this is not just child, this can be an adult. And this, this phenomenon builds over time when you've got someone with neurodivergence who's faced a lot of rejections, multiple rejections, or they've experienced being invalidated repeatedly. Now, remember earlier on, I mentioned the parenting style of you're an idiot, you know, that kind of thing. If, if you've got a sensitive person who is neurodiverse and you raise them up that way, this, this is experiencing repeated rejections and certainly repeated invalidation. And it, be, it can become so severe that that person, even the fear of rejection can cause a full on meltdown. And it's not something that they can control, you know, that they're not able to get a grip because there isn't a grip to be gotten. And bringing another piece of science into it, polyvagal theory tells us that the information highway, the vagal nerve, sends signals to the brain that causes the brain to be flooded with stress hormones, cortisol, you've got your adrenaline coming out, everything's getting you ready for fight or flight when, when you're dysregulated, when you're upset about something. And when your brain is bathed in all these stress hormones that are getting you ready to run away from a saber-toothed tiger, you can't access reason. You can't 
hear what somebody else is saying to you. So, you know, this is one of the reasons why when somebody's really upset and you tell them to calm down, you're likely to have a volcano erupting. Well, yeah, because you, you just kind of prodded them right in it, right? That person cannot calm down. It, it's going to take some time. And so if, if this 17-year-old that was in the video does have rejection sensitive dysphoria, this would be an explanation as to why it went on so long. And I would want to have a conversation with the parents and ask them, you know, first of all, why did you take the phone away? How did you take the phone away? And what do you normally do when your child is so upset? Because letting that go for, you know, six videos worth is an awful lot. And, and the stress that builds up for that 17 year old must be brutal. You know, I, I cannot seriously imagine that she's that way because of permissiveness, I think there's something else at play. Now I can't say for sure, I'm just giving you one spectator's version of what could have happened with that major tantrum. So sometimes kids with special needs can show up with massive behaviors. And the key there is finding the behavior that comes before that and working on that. Now this is a whole big thing to talk about and it's certainly something I work on with my clients. So at the beginning of all of this episode, I mentioned to you that I was going to show you how you could integrate all this information, how you could find the pieces that work for you and your family. And that is very simply by working one-on-one -on -one with me for as long as it takes to get all those pieces in place. And sometimes that can be not too long. Other times it takes a minute. It depends on where you are and, and what kind of things need to be undone and unlearned before the learning can happen. So if this is you and it's something you're interested in, I am available for one-on-one -on -one coaching. And I invite you to contact me at mickeygaffinstone.com mickey at gaffinstone.com or check out my website gaffinstone.com and contact me contact me on facebook or linkedin instagram any of those places i am readily available to talk with you and at least see which direction you'd like to go in next week remember we are going to be looking more at special needs and how kids with special needs can belong in society because fitting in is the opposite of belonging. And we want these kids to belong. These kids are valuable human beings that belong with the rest of us. And they have something to contribute. I'm gonna talk about the superpowers next week too. And if you haven't witnessed it, you might not be aware they're there, but they really, really are. So if you have questions for me, I invite you to bring them, set some boundaries, see how that works for you. Think about it very carefully first. Make lots of notes about what really is important and why and how you're going to keep to that. Because you don't want your kid to be sitting at that slot machine, pressing the button for eight hours, waiting for the big reward. And they do have all day. So you don't. You have things to do. Bear that in mind. And we're going to come to the end of the show momentarily. I will see you soon. Once again, Mickey at gaffinstone.com or www.gaffinstone.com. Find me at either of those places or LinkedIn. And if there are any more questions, I can answer those. Remember, parenting is important all the way through, for, for, forever, for your child forever. It dictates a, in a large way who they're going to be, how they're going to be. Do you want your child to be independent? Let's have a look at what that takes and look at your own childhood story again. How, how did that work out for you? And how can you do it differently? It is the toughest job ever. And if you're a stay-at-home parent, holy smokes, let me just say, hat off to you. I've done it and it is so tough because you're 24-7. I will see you next week. And I look forward to the feedback in the meantime on all the things. Ask me the questions. And if you have a child with special needs, I want to hear from you, please. If you know someone with a child with special needs, ask me your questions. And yes. 
Thank you for listening to the Navigating Complicated Relationship Show. Mickey returns Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Central, 10 a.m. Mountain, 9 a.m. Pacific on InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. Until then, remember every relationship is a journey. And with the right tools, you can create stronger, more fulfilling connections.